Good morning, and uh, welcome to the FDR Presidential Library and Museum. I'm Bill Harris, the director here, and I just want to say thank you all for coming out on this uh, slightly overcast, or maybe completely overcast, um, Saturday. Um, it's nice to have you all here, as well as our virtual audience, too. Um, we're very happy to have, have a, a combined crowd, which really helps us reach more people and the authors to be able to share uh, their stories and their research with a wider audience as well. Let me do a little bit of housekeeping here because we have a format and formats are very important. Um, uh, first, what we'll have is our author who is Bill Rhodes and he'll speak for, I don't know, 15 or 20 minutes probably. And uh, then there'll be question and answers uh, based on the things he's talked about or anything you may have some interest in along these topics related to the book, encourage you. Um, to ask questions. And um, after that, um, we will repair to the uh, lobby uh, for a book signing. So that's good. And now let me say a little bit about Bill Rhodes. He's a professor emeritus of art history at SUNY New Paltz. Um, he studied architectural history at Princeton University. And uh, his dissertation, The Colonial Revival, was published in 1977. And he has lectured widely on on colonial revival, President Roosevelt's art and architectural interest in the architecture of the Hudson Valley. Hence, he's, he can, he's fully prepared to speak broadly and widely uh, on the topic. Real, I'm really setting you up now. Um, he, he is the author of many books on the architectural history of the region and is, has spoken at this reading festival many times. Welcome back. Thanks, Bill, and thanks, Cliff, for inviting me, and thank you for the happy faces I'm looking at in the live audience, and I assume there will be other happy faces hidden from me. Uh, so first of all, I would like to say how happy I am to be speaking about our Elverhoy book here at the Roosevelt site. In the 1970s, when I was a junior professor at New Paltz, my first sabbatical was here at the Roosevelt Library. And so you could say that my archival research on the architecture of the region was born in uh, the FDR Library. So the topic today is Elverhoy, the arts and crafts colony at Milton on Hudson. The first question that many have is, 
well, how do you pronounce Elverhoy? So it's pronounced Elverhoy. Second question might be, what does that word mean? What does it signify? It derives from the Danish for hill of the fairies. So Elverhoy was a Danish American art and craft colony at Milton on Hudson. Its founders were Anders Anderson and Johannes Morton, natives of Denmark who came to the US in the late 1800s, early 1900s, and first came to the Midwest where they developed teaching in art and craft in particularly ending in Wisconsin, in Racine, Wisconsin. In 1912, Morton and particularly Anderson, Anderson was the leader of the colony throughout its history. Morton and Anderson in 1912 moved their colony from Racine, Wisconsin to the east, which is somewhat unexpected. Generally, we move from east to west. They were drawn by the beauty of the Hudson Valley, by the art culture of the Hudson Valley, and particularly they modeled their colony to some extent after Birdcliff, Ralph Radcliffe Whitehead's art colony in Woodstock. They aimed to surpass Birdcliff. They didn't quite manage that but they had high ambitions which were partially, partially met. They had, that is Elverhoy, had an international reputation and particularly through winning a gold medal in 1915 in San Francisco at the Panama Pacific Exposition in 1915. Uh, if we could have that image again, maybe. I was about to leap to the cover of the book. If we could return to the cover. Well, in the meantime. <laughs> he's running, so meantime will be quick. <laughs> Did I do something? I think you meant to just hit the computer a little bit there. You're all right. There you go. Good. So this is the cover of the book that I wrote in collaboration with my wonderful colleague, uh, Leslie Mellon. The book is intended to cover major areas of this art, including jewelry and metalwork, including jewelry and metalwork, which you see in the bird pin at the top. And in fact, Elverhoy was primarily famous for jewelry and metalwork. Here, a portrait of Anders Anderson as a young man as an art teacher in Racine, Wisconsin. This photo appears in the high school yearbook in Racine in 1912, just before they moved the colony to Milton. The postcard shows the appearance of the colony in 1915. Postcard, by the way, which is in the collection of Vivian Wadlin, who has been crucial in the a uh, study of Elverhoy, she owns a large portion of the Elverhoy archive, Vivian Wadlin of Highland. So the postcard shows the studio, a rustic building at the left with a rough stone chimney. And to the right, the house, which was originally on the site, a house owned by Captain Sears in the mid 19th century, a sea captain. 
And so this house became the focal point of the colony in its earliest years in the, 19, in the 1910s. The poster on the right uh, advertising Elverhoy uh, as an art colony with a school. Uh, we see here then again, Anders Anderson who had taught school in Racine uh, will be one of the teachers of art, including craft uh, at, at Elverhoy. The building with the columns is the mansion which attracted Anderson and Morton to this site, a mid 19th century classic revival uh, mansion uh, for Captain Sears with a great view out over the Hudson River. In fact, uh, the porch is very close to a precipice uh, which then uh, provides a vista to the river just beyond. But before you get to the river, the precipice will drop you down to the railroad tracks. And frankly, this is something which Anderson and Morton played down as much as they could. The steam locomotives spouting uh, noise and, and smoke, uh, this was something that the publicity for the colony uh, tried to play down, although emphasizing that it was easy to reach the colony by rail uh, from the uh, New York Central trains. The other photograph here uh, shows one of the Scott sisters who, who are the focus of the study uh, of Leslie Melvin's chapter in the book. The Scott sisters were from Racine and they specialized in textiles. So this arts and crafts colony uh, produced and taught painting, printmaking, uh, and textiles in, in particular, as well as jewelry, as well as jewelry and metalwork. The cover makes use of a photo taken of Anders Anderson seated by a rocky stream bed, which flows down the hillside directly into the Hudson River. So this uh, image of the young Danish American artist craftsman uh, is an image which he used throughout his career to kind of show his strong links to nature and particularly to the nature of the Hudson Valley. The publicity for the jewelry emphasized that, uh, that the jewelry motifs were taken from local plant life, local uh, fauna and flora. They may have fudged some of that publicity uh, because they were capable of borrowing botanical motifs from Wisconsin, although they didn't much publicize this uh, slight uh, altering of source material. Elverhoy flourished in the 1910s when it won that gold medal in San Francisco. In the World War I period, it didn't flourish as America's interests were elsewhere. And in the Depression years, in the Depression years, uh, Elverhoy really struggled. They attempted to, to survive by means of tourists who would spend time at the colony. They also developed a theater which had connections to Broadway. The, the attempt via theater, via tourism, via a dining room uh, didn't succeed. And in 1934, a Poughkeepsie bank foreclosed. And Anderson, of course, was 
devastated as the leader of the colony. And he attempted to enlist the help of a person familiar to you all, that is Eleanor Roosevelt. And there is, there are letters between Anders Anderson and Eleanor Roosevelt as Anderson attempts to rescue the colony from its creditors. Eleanor did her best. She wrote to local power figures and she wrote also to some New Deal uh, administrators attempting to find a financial solution to the demise of Elverhoy. She didn't succeed and Elverhoy was sold to followers of Father Divine. And Father Divine turned, he and his followers, uh, turned Elverhoy into one of Father Divine's largest and most impressive heavens, where people from New York, both black and white, uh, were brought by steamboat to a dock at Milton, and as reported in a long story in the New York Times, came to enjoy the landscape and the food uh, which Father Divine provided cheaply for the public, for his public. After Father Divine left in the, and it was a series of owners, in the 1950s, Elverhoy became the property of the Weiss family. And Bruce Weiss, son of the original couple, was a student of mine at SUNY New Paltz in an art history class. And that's how I first became aware of Elverhoy. And, and Bruce, Wright, Bruce Weiss has been a wonderful help to me in the study we've made of the colony. Bruce Weiss has done his very best to preserve the structures at Elverhoy but nature and vandals have attacked those structures. And so we must uh, send our highest thoughts up to the preservation God to see about how that site can be preserved. Uh, I'd be happy to entertain any questions if, if you have any or now or later. Yes. Okay. Where exactly is it? Where exactly is Elverhoy? Uh, it's on Indian or Old Indian Road in Milton. It's uh, you. It that road is a dead end road which ends in the property. Uh, it's private property, and as I say, there have been vandal damage inflicted, has been. Uh, so it's really not open to the public, but interested persons, you know, can, can see it. So Milton, I think, is sort of the opposite side of the river from the IBM facility in Poughkeepsie, if you're more familiar with this end. Right. From Elverhoy, you can look up to, toward Poughkeepsie and I guess see Vassar Brothers Hospital in the distance from, from, uh, from Elverhoy. And I should mention that the Poughkeepsie connection is very strong, particularly through Vassar College. Uh, Vassar, the president, various faculty members were patrons of Elverhoy and Vassar students routinely often came down to Elverhoy uh, to study art, to spend time in nature, and sort of rub elbows with artists. Vassar uh, happily has recently accepted the donation 
of about half of the Elberhoy archive for the Vassar Library. Yes. Yeah. The arts and crafts. What arts and crafts? What what arts and crafts? You mentioned jewelry. What other crafts do they do or art? Okay, uh, Leslie Melvin's focus has been on textiles, embroidery, weaving, uh, which the Scott sisters carried on, making uh, making use of Scandinavian uh, teachings. There's some mention of, I'm just gonna put this here if you can, thank you. There you go, all right. Is that better? Uh, there's some mention of furniture, but I actually never have found a piece of furniture. Some mention of ceramics, and they had a connection to a pottery near Buffalo, and they also had a connection to book binders uh, in Pittsfield, mass. So it had a number of sort of secondary crafts, but painting led by James Scott, who had, uh, well, there's a James Scott painting of Franklin Roosevelt's Springwood. So there's that connection too. Uh, Scott was a painter. Uh, Ralph Pearson was an etcher, a nationally renowned at your, so a variety of, of crafts. Good morning. Um, <clears throat> you mentioned, excuse me, in 1915 that, you know, they were doing well. And then you jumped to 1934, you know, with the depression. So I'm assuming that during the 20s, it flourished. Uh, in the 20s, the 20s had the problem that the arts and crafts movement was in decline nationally uh, in, in Chicago, elsewhere. And Stickley was, was in decline in the teens. So Elverhoy, in a way, was late in coming to the arts and crafts game. And so it only flourished briefly during the heyday of the arts and crafts movement. Uh, incidentally, Overhoy was written up in Gustav Stickley's Craftsman magazine in 1916, which was the very tail end of Stickley and, in a way, the high point of, of Overhoy when they were given three or four pages in Craftsman magazine of September 16. Uh, so, yeah, uh, the 20s, in the 20s, they tried to make a restaurant and tourism and theater substitute for arts and crafts. Although it never, they never abandoned arts and crafts. It just wasn't sufficient. I have a question. Um, was this group of artists, were they influenced by the William Morris arts and crafts movement as Birdcliff was? Definitely. Yes. Um, They, well, Anderson and, and, the, and the people at Elverhoy, Elverhoy in general were attempting to find an alternative to industrial production. Uh, Anderson talked about the soul and how the individual craftsperson could express the innermost soul in ways which the factory worker could not. And speaking of the English arts and crafts movement, C.R. Ashby, an English leader of the English arts and crafts movement, uh, came to Elverhoy and wrote about it in his diary, which is the most revealing sort of under under, under the, not undercover, but uh, uncensored, uh, uncensored description of what was going on at Elverhoy. And Ashby was in general very favorably impressed with Elverhoy, whereas he was not so favorably impressed with Birdcliff, which makes us Elverhoy fans 
smile from ear to ear. Yes. Sorry about that. Any other questions? Okay, thank you. Okay, how about a round of applause for our first speaker? And we're going to head out.